<laughs> My, what an opportunity God has opened. We're talking tonight about confidence in the day of judgment. Now, the day of judgment is on the way. It's, it's on God's schedule, and you will be there. It is true that there is some hokey theology that's been developed to say you won't be there, but don't believe it. You'll be there. You will give an account for all the deeds done in the body, whether they're good or whether they're evil. It doesn't make any difference. You will give account for every word you said. You'll give account for it. Preachers will give account for every sermon they preached. I'm kind of anxious for that affair to start. It's going to happen. Now, what we want to target is being confident and bold and assured in that day. My text is taken from the book of 1 John, the fourth chapter, verses 16 and 17. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwells in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness or confidence in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in the world. Now, it's not fashionable these days to talk about the day of judgment. I, uh, I don't know whether some people in town have ever heard about the day of judgment. Seems like of all the important stuff, people aren't preaching on. Have you ever noticed that? Seems like the unimportant things are what people preach on. Unimportant things are things that are going to pass. Just to, to, I want to just take a moment to define what's important in preaching and what's unimportant. What's important in preaching is stuff that's going to last. Things that are eternal. Things that are on God's schedule. Things that are on God's agenda. Things that God has asked you to be prepared for. Things that Christ's redemption has prepared people for. Those are important things. Now things that are temporal, things that are going to pass, things that aren't going to last, those are unimportant things. You don't want to make those the topic of your preaching. Because like when you get to heaven, you'll have nothing to say. A lot of preachers are going to have to fold up, shut up when they get to glory if they get there because they have spent their lives talking about things that are going to pass. And the word of God says we, which includes all preachers and teachers and elders and deacons and so forth, we are to look at things that are not seen. For the things that are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Now we're going to focus on one of those unseen realities uh, tonight. The day of judgment. <clears throat> Our text starts out by saying, We have known and believed the love that God has to us. We have known and believed. The New American Standard Bible says, We have come to know and have believed. The NIV says, we know and rely on the love God has for us. Weymouth says, we know the love which God has for us and we confide in it. It's a big verse we're talking about here. Actually, as I understand it, the tense means this. We have come to know and still know the love God has to us. Amen. It wasn't a point in time where he picked up a little extra knowledge and that was it. When we knew this, this was something that we keep on knowing. We keep on retaining. We keep on relying on this. We keep on confiding in this. There may be a lot of people that love you at one time and don't love you anymore. You may have experienced a beginning of love and a termination of love by other personalities, but God loved you and God still loves you. Amen. And you can rely on that love just as surely tonight as when you came out of death and trespasses and sins. You can still rely upon it. So he asserts, we know the love of God. We believed it. God told it. 
Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us. And there is a phenomenal amount of scripture devoted to telling us Christ laid down his life for us. Jesus testified about it. God testified about it. Apostles testified about it. Prophets testified about it. About a Savior coming into the world and forfeiting his rights so you could be saved. It's a manner of love, a kind of love, the likes of which the world has never seen. Amen. Now when it says we have believed, we have believed this and we know it. He's saying that by knowing it is experiential knowledge. Yeah, but people don't know what that means. That's just a dictionary definition. What it means is you're living in the domain where the love takes place. Amen. There is a sphere, a realm, a circumference in which the love of God operates. Yes. There's a realm in which the love of God can be experienced. And when he says we know means we're living in the room where the love of God is experienced. Where you get close enough to God to experience his love, not just hear about it. Amen. So you can live at a distance from God and you can hear faint rumblings of the love of God, but never really participate in it. Our text says we have participated in it. Like God has opened up the eyes of our heart or understanding. As Ephesians 1 tells us. He has opened up the eyes of our heart. So we will know what the hope of his calling is. What, what's God doing in this redemption anyway? He has a large project on the board. To know the hope of his calling. The objective God has called you to. To conform you to the image of his son. To bring you into his realm. To stamp his name upon you. And the name of the city of God upon you. And Christ's new name upon you. Which is another way of saying to bring you where you fit in. Where God is. That holy realm where no mortal has ever felt at home. To make you feel at home there. Isaiah one time was just caught up there in a vision. Like to scare him to death. He said, Woe am I, I'm a man of unclean lips and dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. He felt ill at ease there until there was a cleansing that took place. God's target is to bring you to a point where you're not ill at ease in his presence, in his unveiled presence, in his face-to-face -face presence, the hope of his calling. And he wants to open your eyes as to the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, which is another way of saying Salvation's what you got. You're what God got. And God did not buy garbage. You are inheritance for our Lord. He promised, you know, to give the Lord Jesus the heathen for his inheritance. And it was a big enough inheritance. Jesus threw himself into the work. Now God wants you to see how big that is. And then he wants you to see the exceeding greatness of his power that's toward us that believe. Now that, all of that is sort of a breakdown of knowing and believing the love of God. It's that sort of thing. It's experiencing it. It's having an acute awareness of it. It's being sensitive to it. It's being personally benefited and profited by it. See, this is where faith and experience merge together. And a holy wedding takes place. And when your theology and your experience mold together into one. And what you believe and what you are are the same thing. We know and we have believed the love that God has toward us. Faith and experience are intimately connected in Christ Jesus. It's tragic that certain parts of the Christian community have elected to emphasize the experience and neglect the, the faith part, which is understanding and the ascent and the perception and this sort of thing. And other parts have chosen to emphasize the intellectual and perceptive part and ignore the experience. But here, if you really want to overcome, the two have to come together. Amen. You have to believe and know the love that God has towards you. And John speaks for the family when he says, this is what's happened to us. We heard the message. We believe the message. And... God brought us into the message, so we become a part of it. And then he makes this profound statement. God, 
is love. Now there are several places in Scripture where it says what God is. You probably are familiar with many of them. You read in the Word of God where our God is a consuming fire. Or where our God is a jealous God. Or where God is thy refuge. Or where God is my strength and power. He is a lot of these in the Word of God. God is gracious and merciful. Or God is mighty. Or God is the King in all the earth. Or God is my salvation. Or God is the strength of my heart. See, it's all over in the word of God. God God's people become God conscious. Instead of talking about who they are, they start to talking about who God is. Instead of talking about what they've done, they start to talk about what God's done. Not for these bragging sessions where people come together and tell what they've done. God is my strength. God is my king. God is a sun and a shield. How's that? God is the rock of my salvation. God is holy. God is merciful. God is righteous in all his works. God is true. God is a spirit. God is faithful. Just a few. Hear you, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. One single focused personality. In Deuteronomy 10, 17, he says he's the God of gods and the Lord of lords. John said in another place, God is light, illuminating and clarifying and bringing understanding and confidence. And the closer you get to God, the clearer things become. The further you get from God, the vaguer things become. The closer you draw to God in his light, you see light. Other things that didn't seem plain become plain. But here in our text, he rises higher still. God is love. When he states this, he's telling us that God, particularly in regards to our salvation, God is love. That is, God is a giving, providing, blessing, guiding, protecting God. Amen. He's a resource to God's people. He has an inclination to give Amen. and a propensity to bless. He has a deep desire to bestow. He wants to extend himself, to share himself, to show himself, to reveal his covenant, to open his purpose. He is love. God is love. He is urging us to begin receiving. See, if God is love, then this means he's approachable. This means what he promises is obtainable. It means he's like a wellspring. He's like a fountain. He's like a mine rich with the jewels and gold. He's like a treasury. He's like a storehouse made accessible to you. God is love. He has given you the new birth. He's given you the Holy Spirit. He's given you grace. God is love. Amen. He's given you truth. He's given you eternal life. He's given you strength. God is love. He's given you joy. He's given you peace. He's given you love. God is love. He's given you faith. He's given you all things pertaining to life and godliness. God is love. See? He's given you everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. He's given you the spirit of power and love and a sound mind. God is love. See? He's given us richly all things to enjoy. He's given us a savior and a mediator and a new covenant. God is love. He's given us exceeding great and precious promises. He's given us mercy, the knowledge of the truth, the scriptures, and a lot of other things. God is love. See, you get close enough to God, you'll find out, my, this is a great love wherewith he has loved us. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God, and sons get the inheritance. In fact, he that overcomes receives all things. See, there is a union between God and those that advantage, take advantage of his love. In fact, the text says, he that dwells in God, he that dwells in love dwells in God, and God dwells in him. I, that's phenomenal. You don't hear that preached very often. I mean, that's, that's phenomenal. Sometime when I, when I had a little more resources and could fly, more frequently, 
It was always nice to sit to someone and say to someone next to the plane, you know, God dwells in me. And they look rather peculiar at you. What are you, an Eastern religion you've embraced or what? Oh, no, you know, I'm in Christ. And he gave this to him. He that dwells in love dwells in God, and God dwells in him. There is a remarkable union that takes place between God and men in Christ, a union that will stand the test of the judgment day. Now, whatever stands the test of the judgment day, I want that. Whatever won't stand the test of the judgment day, I'm not interested in. Not on any long-term basis. I want to be able to pass through the fire. And judgment day is like a fire. Everybody's going to pass through it. And folk that pretended like they were gold, silver, and costly stones or wood, hay, and stubble, they won't pass through it. Remarkable union between uh, God and his people. He that dwells in love, that is, who lives where the blessing is. That's, that's just very practical what he's talking about here. Who dwells in love doesn't mean you're milk soppy and milk toasty and really nice and soppy all the time. That's not what it means. It means God is love and a person dwelling in love is living where God's bestowing his love. That's where he's living. He inhabits the place that God's love is shed abroad. That's where he lives. He that dwells in love dwells in God and God in him. Now that's, this isn't the first place that this is stated like this. 1 John 3.24 says, He that hath his commandments dwells in him and he in him. There it is again. Here it is in 1 John 4.12. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us and his love is perfected in us. This sounds good. 1 John 4.16 says, We have known and believed the love that God has to us. God is love. And he that dwells in love dwells in God and God in him. There it is, several places in the Word of God. God dwells in us. We dwell in God. It's like this. If somebody opposes God, they're opposing us. If somebody opposes us, they're opposing God. God says, I'll bless them. It's what he said to Abraham, and I'm, I've partaken of the blessing of Abraham. In fact, I'm a seed to Abraham. So are you. If any man be in Christ, he says, if you're in Christ, you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. That's Galatians 3.29. So I figure when he says, I'll bless them that bless you and curse them that curse you, that goes for me too. It's in God's timetable. I know it's in God's timetable. But God's going to correct. He's going to correct all the dis injustices that took place in this world against God's people. He's going to correct it and side with God's people. Good to have God dwelling in you. So when you face the judgment day, say you were in the Sanhedrin when Stephen was stoned, like I hope they got converted by the day of judgment, because that trial is going to be resumed. And God's going to set the record straight, siding with his people. Jesus promised this concerning God dwelling in us. He said, he that has my commandments and keeps them he says, my father, my father will love him. <clears throat> well, so much for unconditional love. He says, <laughs> that's a condition there. My father will love him, and we will come and make our abode with him. Yeah, that's what he's talking about here. And uh, the Holy Spirit said in 1 Corinthians 6, 17, that if any man is joined to the Lord, he's one spirit. It's God in him, he in God. I want to move on from that, although I'm tempted to dwell there because that's such a marvelous truth. He that dwells in love dwells in God and God in him. <laughs> My, that's what I try and discover your relationship to God from that basis and live where God doesn't have a hard time loving you. Live so it's easy for God to love you. Jesus said, abide in my love. Is that what he said? Abide in my love. So I abode in my Father's love. <laughs> I didn't make it hard for God. I didn't make it hard for the Father to love me. Don't you make it hard for me to love you. And if you're that way, God will take up residence in you. Now he says that, uh, talks about perfected love then. Perfect love 
casts out all fear. And he's going to tell us it makes us ready to go into the day of judgment. What is perfected, perfected love? That's love that's shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Spirit, which is given to you. That's Romans 5, 5. It's when the love of God permeates your whole life. And you begin to associate everything with you and God. Where you don't live independently of God. Or in ignorance of God. There are a lot of people who make their decisions without ever bringing God into the picture. Without contemplating God. There are other people that do bring him into the picture. And love is perfected in those people. The love of God, they are transformed into God's image is another way of saying it. They obtain the characteristics of God and they are changed into his likeness by the Spirit of God. People who, in whose heart the love of God is perfected, they run to Jesus instead of running from him like Adam did. Every time they have difficulty, they run to Jesus. Amen. And Jesus loves to receive such. He says... He that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. I will not do it. The word of God tells us, and I'm, I'm for introducing these kind of services. I had kind of hoped to pioneer it in the Joplin area. They have had uh, seeker services, you know. I don't know what those are supposed to be. Seeker services. I want to institute fleeing services. See, we have fled to him for refuge. I'd like to have services for people that have fled to Christ for refuge to lay hold on the hope set before him. Fleeing services. I, I recommend that if anyone would like to help me institute that, I would like to. Say, if you're, if you're running to Christ, we'd like to make it easier for you to find him. Amen. If you're fleeing to Christ, we'd like to make it easier for you to be more conscious of him, more aware of his blessing. That's where the love of God is perfected, is in those things. The love of God is perfected in a person who counts everything but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. The things that were gained to me, I counted dung. Dung. Take them out the dung gate. Take them out. For the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things. And I do count them but dung that I may know him. Amen. And the power of his resurrection. And the fellowship of his suffering. See, that's how the love of God is perfected in a person. Then he said, herein is our love made perfect. Here's the outcome of it, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. I suppose any of us that have been serious about God at some point in our life had the experience uh, young Jonathan shared with us about being afraid of the judgment day. I can remember, I can remember that very vividly too. It's a good healthy fear, kind of wake a person up. Because the judgment day is a sure day, it's sure coming. I've often wondered what would the impact be if that was preached on a little more. The judgment day. We used to sing songs about the judgment day. I dreamed the great judgment morning had dawned and the trumpet had blown. And I'll tell you, if you, if you weren't in Christ, you sing songs like that, kind of get you to trembling. If you weren't close to Christ. Judgment day. Boldness in the day of judgment. Now there is, there is a day of judgment. Uh, there are several places in the Word of God that talk about it. One of the more graphic pictures is found in the book of the Revelation. In the 20th chapter, just a few words, but it paints a graphic picture for you. I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell of the grave and the boat of the spirits gave up their dead which were in them and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Well, now those are arresting words. And they're intending, intended to be arrested, arresting. The day of judgment. <clears throat> Our Lord Jesus spoke about this day of judgment several times, alerting people to it. It's going to be a grand occasion for the saved, 
But there are going to be nations and cities and people rise up on the day of judgment that did not have the advantage that you have. And if you didn't take advantage of the advantage you had, they'll rise up in judgment against you. Let me give you a couple of examples. Matthew 10 and verse 15 says, Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. That's a city that rejected their testimony, that rejected the gospel of the kingdom that they preached. More tolerable. More, you know, it'd be frightening for someone to see. It'd be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah than for a lot of people in Joplin. Sodom and Gomorrah never heard what a lot of people in Joplin or Carl Junction, or Webb City, or Springfield, or St. Louis. They ever heard what they've heard. In fact, Matthew eleven twenty four 24 says, I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable in the land, for the land of Sodom in that day of judgment than for thee. See, when God's gospel goes out, it is not at your option to reject it, or to put it on the back burner or to make God secondary, or to be a part-time Christian, or sort of to give a little bit of yourself to God. It won't wash in the day of judgment. It will not wash. Here's another text of scripture. Matthew eleven twenty-two. I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. Another place it said, the queen of Sheba will rise up in the day of judgment and condemn this generation. For she came from afar to hear the words of Solomon, hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, a wiser than Solomon is here. Amen. Nineveh, said the people of Nineveh, going to rise up in the day of judgment and condemn the generation because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, a greater than Jonah is here. You know, they didn't have any nice positive sermon from Jonah, if you'll remember. How did they? He starts preaching to the city. He says, 40 days and the city's going to be overthrown. That's it. That was his message. They repented at a message like that. I tell you, brother, in the gospel, we got to preach. People ought to be repenting all over the place at the message we've got to preach. The day of judgment. We'll bring those people out to condemn generations that did not repent at the preaching of Christ. Another thing Jesus said about the day of judgment, and it's a sobering word. I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Now, I mean, if they're going to give an account of every idle word, you can be sure they will of every deliberate word on the day of judgment. So when you speak... Speak with the day of judgment in mind. It was Peter that said, God knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation <laughs> and to reserve the ungodly to the day of judgment to be punished. God knows how to do that. And quite candidly, I want the first part of the verse to be for me. I want him to know how to deliver the godly out of temptation. That's the part I want, not to reserve the ungodly out of the judgment of the great day. What is the purpose of the day of judgment? And why have confidence in the face of it? The day of judgment is not, of course, to determine who's going to heaven and who's going to hell. That's determined here. That's determined here. It's a day of vindication. A vindication of God. And a day of accountability. When everyone that's received something from God, no matter how small it may have appeared, whether it's one talent or ten, they're going to appear before God to give an account of how they handled his goods. Did they squander them? Did they multiply them? Did they bury them? What did they do with his goods? The day of judgment has to do with this sort of thing. It's a day of vindication. David said this in Psalm 51.4, and it's quoted again in Romans 3, 4, I believe. He said, Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this great evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and overcome when thou art judged. 
See, God, David, when he sinned with Bathsheba, and this was 51st Psalm, was his repentant psalm when he had sinned in the sin with Bathsheba and Uriah the Hittite. He was in conflict, sharp conflict with God at this point. God had condemned adultery and he had condemned murder and David had committed both. Now God is not going to let this go. God does not lie. In the day of judgment, if it's not settled here, it's going to be settled there. That's why it's imperative to flee to Christ for refuge, to lay hold on the hope set before you. That's why it's imperative. Because if you have been at loggerheads with God, God's going to win this battle. Make no mistake about it. He's going to be vindicated in all his sayings. Every single one. Every meticulous word he's spoken. He's going to be vindicated. Now, brethren, what salvation is about is getting on his side in this life. And in this world, it's appropriating the great salvations in Christ Jesus that liquidates your debt, erases your past, brings you into conformity with Christ, unites you with him, and gets you ready for this great confrontation. That's the purpose of salvation. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, We must all appear, appear, appear. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account for the deeds done in the body, whether they're good or whether they're evil. Now, how is it a person can have confidence in a day like that? <clears throat> well, actually, he tells you why in verse 17. He says, because we may have boldness of the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in the world. We've been a partaker of the divine nature, as Peter would put it. We have obtained the mind of Christ, as Paul would put it. We are being changed into the same image, as 2 Corinthians 3 says. We are being renewed in the likeness of Christ's image, as Colossians 3.10 puts it. We're being changed to be like Christ, and now, see, now, so we can stand in boldness then. No one who's like Jesus will be intimidated by the day of judgment. In fact, they will be rather glad for it. And the thought occurred to me several times. I know he's not going to go in alphabetical order, but if he did, like B, that's up at the top. And right now, tonight, tonight, by God's grace, I can already give back to God more than he gave to me when he saved me. I've been able to increase. You have too. I mean, it's just not me. You too can give back more. He gave you two talents you got got five. Look, Lord. Ha <laughs> ha, look. I'm able to give you back more. Huh? I started out, I didn't know very much. I'm, I'm kind of knowing more about this now. Amen. I started out, I was a little confused about things. I'm just clearing up to me now, Lord. I started out, I wasn't sowing beside all waters. Now I am. I'm sowing beside all waters. And the Lord says, it's coming back to you now on the day of judgment. You can have confidence because you you're being changed right now, partakers of Christ. How can we have confidence in the day of judgment? Well, one way we stand, we are standing some preliminary judgments. Here in this world, there are preliminary judgments and preliminary tests and preliminary trials, huh? if need be, that you suffer for a while, if need be. But then afterward, he perfects you and settles you and makes you into his image. You think of the trials you've passed through. I mean, think about it. Huh? All of you have had some trials you've passed through. Think of them as passing some tests of judgment from God. Where he put the fire under you a little bit. huh? And you come out. We'd have to bear witness to each other about all the difficulties we've passed through. We'd have to testify to it to you because you see the smell of smoke's not on our clothes. Some of us would have tell you the things that's happened to us. You'd say, whoa, I had no idea that happened to you. huh?" Don't smell smoke at all. Not a hair is singed. As you pass some preliminary tests. And every test you pass like that builds up the confidence for standing before God on the day of judgment. If you can stand before God here, you'll stand before him there. Amen. See, when we gather together or when we're at home or whatever we're doing, God's there. 
Christ is there. Holy Spirit's there. Holy angels are there. They're all there. And if you live in awareness of this, an acute awareness of this, it does affect the way you live. It does affect what you do. It affects what you watch, where you go. It affects it. And it sh that shapes you up. Pretty soon you feel, com you feel confident in God's presence here. Oh, you know, I've been in some church services that scared some people. They were at such a distance from God, it was frightening for them to sit there. And I was, I was rather relishing it. I was drinking it, and I said, oh, it is good for us to be here. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And if you get glad enough about going to the house of the Lord, pretty soon you'll see, I was glad when they said to me, you're going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. I'm anxious because the world hasn't given me a fair shake. But Jesus has, and when I appear before him, oh, that is going to be a grand and glorious day. See, because you passed some tests here, it gives you confidence you can pass them there. If you've endured chastening here, you can stand confidence there. See, in chastening the Lord to buffet you here and there, shape you up a little bit, huh? That you could be partaker of his holiness, that's what he does it for. And it will yield the peaceable fruit of righteousness to them who are exercised thereby. Sometimes when you see me kind of uh, drooping, you can say, I see you're on your exercise program again. God is exercising you through this. But if you pass it, it bolsters you for confidence in the day of judgment, see? God, if you look at life this way, it's a series of smaller judgments, reduced judgments, judgments that don't consume you, but that refine you, and there's a big, big difference. The day of judgment isn't going to refine anybody. It isn't going to change anybody. Here's where that takes place. And if it takes place here, it will definitely take place there. Here, if you can endure some opposition here, <laughs> you don't have to worry about God there. See, He'll side with you. In other words, if you stand here, you'll stand there. That's, that's just kind of what boils down. See, we will be gathered, brethren, to the captain of our salvation. When we stand before him, this is the one that's been leading us, folks. And if he led you through the fire and he led you through the water here, you think he's going to abandon you there? If you went through the preliminary test here, the preliminary test, and the master of this vessel stood with you, and if he walked on the storm here for you, and you received him, don't you know he'll do it there? Yeah, you'll be rallied around the angels, they'll be all around you. These are your protectors in the world. God's ministers that minister to you here. I think uh, when time comes to leave the world and cross over, make the transition, step over into the eternal realm, so to speak, fight your greatest battle. Hmm. Oh, Satan will come at you harder there probably than at any other time. This angelic ministry, yeah, they're not going to abandon you. <laughs> They'll rally, hey! Call him in here to help strengthen this brother or sister, get him ready to pass over. And they'll be up there. They're going to be the reapers. They'll be rallied around you, <laughs> saying, and Jesus will be standing by you. He'll say, Father, hey, he's my children. See, my children, we're all here. Everything make for confidence there if you walk with Christ here. Amen. It'll make for confidence there. You see, we become strangers and pilgrims here. Whereas we confess this. We confess this. I'm a stranger and a pilgrim in the world. Fleshly lusts war against my soul. Well, if I'm a stranger and a pilgrim here, I'm not going to be one there. The day of judgment isn't going to be here. It's going to be there. <laughs> and so we'll be standing in the home country. We'll be in the home country when we're judged there. And we're going to fit in. Just fit right in. Blend in with all the decor, so to speak. We come to love righteousness and hate iniquity here. That gives us confidence there because that's all there is there. Give you confidence here. Here the law is written on our hearts and put on our minds here. And that, that's, that's all it is up there. And, and here it's already part of you. So you stand. Oh, this is good. This is good. I'm standing here where what God says is dominant and 
I've already learned to live with that preference. I feel, I feel confident here. This is going to happen. I feel confident here. I've been enlightened. I tasted of the heavenly gift. I've been made a partaker of the Holy Spirit. I've tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. And, huh, I feel at home here, Lord, before your throne. Judgment doesn't intimidate me because it's going to be in my favor if I'm in Christ. Confidence in the day of judgment. I've been washed. I've been sanctified. I've been justified. All the things that God cannot tolerate. Christ has cleansed me from them. I've learned to hate them. I, I feel confident here. All the lack of confidence you have is due to the vestiges of sin that are lingering on me. That's the thing that makes you feel uncomfortable. But that's all going to be gone when you stand before Christ. Faith yields marvelous benefits, brothers and sisters, both in this world and the world to come. If you are not afraid to side with Jesus here, and you do have to side with him, you do have to make the decision to do so. But if you are not afraid or hesitant to make the decision to side with him here, God will see to it that you have confidence there. You will not have to fear it. Let's have a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank thee that we can have confidence in the day of judgment. We thank you. You have told us about the day of judgment. Told us about what will take place there. Told us of the awesomeness of it. But that when you have raised the Son of Righteousness with heating in his wings and helped us to view him and to see him and to then see the day of judgment as a day of glorious advantage, help us to anticipate it with joy. In Jesus' name, amen.